I'm Kyoki Chidoku, and well, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about myself in an introduction other than that I like writing really long things and giving people cyanide cookies as part of a tradition. <laughs> and I am uh, Sika, or Sartanania, and um, yes, um, both of us are uh, R are RMBRP moderators, Indeed. and um, we have written this uh, RP over the course of a few months. It's in fact started in late no, on the eleventh of November, uh, twenty two thousand and eighteen, and is uh, still ongoing today, although we are on a temporary pause. Indeed, yes. It is called. Um, well, we are currently calling it the Sartanian Story Arc, and it's currently comprised of four chapters, not five, Fiji. So we had to divide the latest chapter into separate dispatches to fit everything, because otherwise it goes over the text limit that you're allowed to post in one dispatch. So, the Sartanian Story Arc is the story of the of the little nation on on the uh, on the eastern coast of the continent of Aenea known as Sartanania and their interaction with the much larger tyrannical empire of Kido Kyokushidoku if you can even, well I call it an empire but less needs to be corrected and it follows the it follows two um, four main events where the um, the Sartanians or the area that is that is Sartanania has not really been relevant in the world for the la since 1953 after the end of the Sartanian civil war where the 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 rem remnants of the nation went into a, f a phase of isolation However, in in 2018, uh, due to a strange occurrence of readings, the the Chidokuren sent a scouting party if, or investigation team, um, I shall say, to to the area to investigate something strange they had they had found. Um. What they find is Sartanania, and during their investigation, things happen and go wrong, and they return. And the decision is made for the Shidokuren intervention in the area, for the purpose of um, uh, what, what's it called? Help me here, Kyoki. <laughs> Well, the Chidokurens basically take any kind of perceived supernatural threat very seriously due to certain past events. So their goal in the intervention in Sartanania was originally just to identify and examine and possibly eliminate any such threats which they thought they had detected in the area. Yes, and what they had detected was... A faint with constant reading, something that wasn't really present anywhere else. So eventually they they lead into we lead into the second chapter, the which is called Operation Mindbreaker, and which follows the very brief invasion of Sartanania and the main part of the event, the um, uh, the uh, experiences of Auzora Chilmi. Am I like, pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, that's pretty good pronunciation. Yes, good. Um, and her experiences in encountering this reading they have, a, she, which is another character, a Sartanian by the name of Monica. Or Monica, if you're actually going to pronounce it like you're supposed to. Which is the main event of what was the main plan event of that RP, and then they battle each other, which leads to the um, capture of Monica, and which 
also leads to the annexation of Sarjanania by the Kyokichidoku, as they perceive that they must bring stability to the region for the, re for the reasons that they believe that Monica's influence over the nation has been absolute. Thus, they seize the region and try to administer it. This leads into the third chapter, known as Operation Shattered Illusion, which is the uh, which follows the which follows the interrogation and exchanges of con of conversation between Monica and Alzora, and heavily focuses on these two characters and their experiences with mild and not so mild at all um, happenings of uh, torture scenes, which yeah. you may not may or may not want to read. You don't have to. Um, the only reason half the person that have a big bold warning in front of them. Yes. Um, which eventually leads to the complete mental breakdown of the character Monica. Which then leads to the end of the Monica's involvement in the story for now. And leads us into the fourth and ongoing chapter, Operation Enduring Tyranny. Which so far describes the situation in Sartanania a month uh, starting a month well starting a week but then jumping to a month station and um the sartanian and chidokran view and experience in sartanania and the eventual armed um resistance movement against the tyrannical what they perceive as a tyrannical, oppressive, uh, oppressive regime. Yes, and the is... Judokarans would not disagree with that assessment, but they just wouldn't see it as a particularly bad thing. Well, so far, after enduring tyranny, which we have revealed already, they will end with the um, declaration of independence of Sartanania. Um, there will be at least one chapter. I will not reveal what it will be about, um, because that would be spoiling and that would be no fun. And um, they will most likely be after that because of the implications of that. So we have no real planned end to it. Yeah, that's pretty much that. <laughs> well, that actually um, goes into a question that I had, uh, just kind of about how you guys created it. Um, what exactly, uh, how, how, how much free planning went into this? Like, because there are a number of different ways one can RP. And I was curious, was this more of a, I'll post something and then uh, the next person will react to that and it was just sort of this string of reactive RPs or did you guys sit down and plan each post out to the detail? Uh, what was your process when it came to writing it? Well, a bit of both, honestly. Um, it depended uh, really on what was being ha was happening in the RP at the moment. As a lot of it, we, we I don't think I've ever DM'd someone as intense intensely <laughs> as during uh, the <laughs> this yeah. RP. Like we're we're talking hundreds of messages <laughs> per day. <laughs> Some days, like it, it was kind of insane amounts of planning and um, discussions and what like wh where we wanted to go, how yes. we wanted to things to occur and things like that. And it, but still. Uh, the way we uh, we aimed to plan it was that we w we wanted the uh, uh, what's it called? We wanted the story to still be exciting for ourselves. Like we we describe we agreed on what something would happen, but not how. Or like uh, after the end of enduring tyranny, I gave Kyoki the choice. Like how does he want to? Because uh, 
the, the main purpose, like the original idea of the RP was to have a an encounter and a fight between Monica and Alzora. That was the original idea I had behind the RP itself. Mm. And um, off the render, um, and we had to think of a realistic way that it would we we could make that happen, which is how, which is why sweep Operation Sweeping Scythe, the first uh, chapter, effectively does. It gives Alzora Shumi a reason to go to Sarchenania, and then Kyoki was left with a choice: How is he want, does he want to approach the situation of Sarchenania, and he had the choice of basically going in the same type of way again, and basically an infiltration this time with Alzora in the in, in the lead, do an invasion, which is the choice he picked, or something else. I can't. There was a third option which I can't remember. It's it's been a while ago. There were numerous options for a lot of parts of it. it there were generally specific goals we had in mind as we wrote each particular post, but a lot of the specific details were very flexible, hence the need for a lot of DMs, basically, to make sure everything was acceptable and such. Yes, but of course we prefer to like keep ourselves to be vague when we ask questions to each other, because if you explain everything you're going to write, you might as well not write it because the other person knows exactly what you're going to write, and that's not fun to read. So, as an example, during... Um, which one am I thinking of? During, say, during the fight between Azora and Monica, for example, I told... I asked... Let's see. Basically, I explained what... I explained very, very vaguely what uh, Monica could do and what I would be able to do with her. We all we have already already decided that Monica's gonna lose. She has no way of winning. It, it, it is impossible. Uh, so and each basically each post we decided where where it was going to end. Not how it was going to end that way or quite the way, but where like where where the other person's going to continue the story. And, of course, each post, basically, uh, to give an example, Azora does this, encounter with Monica, stop. Monica, her experience during, what, uh, during from the point of Azora to meeting her, meeting Azora, and then uh, what Monica experiences for a few minutes, the next person, and basically overlapping all the time, so you get both characters' points of view. But you don't tell the other RP exactly what you're going to write. You you agree on a goal for each post, and then write up to that post, basically up to that goal in a way that fits the characters, that fits the setting as best as possible. If you understand what I mean here. No, very much so. Very much so. Um, so. You guys were talking about how, you know, this was a, a, a sort of, it kind of was born out of an idea to have uh, Monica fight um, Azora. Uh, how, and, and that's very fascinating. First of all, I find it fascinating because you guys, you know, it, it's a kernel of an idea that expanded into so much more. But beyond that, I'm curious, uh, how do they sort of reflect each other? Uh, they both kind of have supernatural uh, telepathic abilities. Uh, obviously, there's some sort of similarity between them that drew you guys to deciding, hey, let's put these two characters together. How would you say they reflect off of each other? Well, I think we should first, uh, to be able to answer this question, first explain, basically explain our characters, because that is a very important part in answering that question. Basically, who are these two people? So That's I'm going to true. let I'm going to let Kiyoki explain and tell us about Azora first, since Azora is a much older and more established ca character in the community. Right. So, oh goodness, this is a bit complicated to talk about, since talking about Azora really depends on what part of her life we're actually up to. 
but at this stage, she is capable of the supernatural, not telepathy or mind altering, but basically magical fire. She is an experienced fighter and at this time has a very specific objective in eliminating potential supernatural threats to reality as she sees it. She is also, she considers herself something of a patron of order. She absolutely values order and tyranny and such, hence why she is a tyrant. And she has experienced a lot of various forms of suffering in her life. She has also inflicted a lot of suffering in her life. So in that sense, that sort of suffering is sort of part of a shared motif throughout a lot of this. But Alzora basically is a bit complicated to discuss, but in this story, effectively, she is recently, she's gone through the Nightmare War, which is something that I'm sure we'll probably get talked about at some point. But basically, yeah, what I, I want to know is... Later, sorry, but yes. uh, yeah. The basics that you need to know for what I'm about to say for that is that um, basically half of Kyoki Chidoku got killed in that war, and it was a war against an alternate universe of Kyoki Chidoku led by a different, somehow more crazy Azora. And she is absolutely terrified of becoming very much like that. So she's trying to go very light on the sadism, which plays into things later, because she is a bit sadistic and that can get overwhelming. She's also very paranoid and desires order and basically believes that any democratic government is destined to fall into chaos eventually. So I think that's the basics of what you need to know about her for this. And then we get to Monica, or Monica. Monica is a South um, She, I really, I, I, she's much easier to begin the uh, begin exp um, explaining as she is the um, she's ne not the leader of the nation in fact uh, at the at the point of the invasion which is a good center point Sartanina is a direct democracy uh, a system basically enforced by Monica in 1953 as Monica's story starts with the Sartanian civil war, which began in 1950, where, similarly to the Nightmare War, a significant part of the population died. However, the Sartanian civil war was more, well, conventional, as it was a conflict that, that grew out of desperation, as the Sartanian federation, as it was then, turned to fighting each other as they ran out of essentially every essential resource for human life. And due to Monica's experiences and particular non-natural abilities of telepathy and a sort of telepathic subliminal communication, if you understand what I mean with subliminal communication. Thus, she was able to convince people of following her during the Civil War. However, her experiences during the Civil War permanently shaped her into the character you meet in 2018 that fights Azora, a character that utterly despises fighting, utterly, uh, what's it called, unwilling to see uh, people die, uh, suffering is something she cannot allow. And she has the values that everyone has the right, has rights. And basically, she enforced the system of direct democracy. But during the point in time, she does not have control of a Sarsha 9. In fact, she's officially dead. And that's where it ties into your question, Pry. Where, if I'm remembering your question correctly here, you... Um... I, I was curious how they reflected each other. Um, in what way... 
do they sort of uh, represent near images of each other? Because I, I very much got that sense. Uh, Azora is a very capable warrior. Monica doesn't seem to like fighting. They both seem to have different value systems. And I, I, I was just curious how that kind of played out in an RP. Well, Mo I can only speak really from Monica's point of view. She sees Azora as a... Basically, she sees Alzora as someone. She doesn't exactly. Dis. Uh, basically, she doesn't exactly. Hate Azora for who she is. She sees her as someone who who is misguided. As, in the end, Alzora does not want death. In fact, she just wants order, but which is something that Monica would also want. However, the methods of the of getting there is the is where they conflict. And they see each other as basically wanting the wrong thing. Thus well, at least in Monica's point of view, as she has no had well previously very faint ideas of the whole arcane nature of Alzora until well she read her mind, but that's that's a that's a different part of the story, and thus she reflects her as someone that is set her mind on this goal that Monica sees as misguided and wrong. However, how Monica reflects on Alzora as a person is as someone who is shattered but still hangs together in a way. And someone who, if it were a different situation, would be willing to help. But obviously, in the situation we they are they they find themselves in, that is an impossibility. Now, if we could uh, get Alzora's reflections and points of view on Monica. So initially, when Azora first hears about Monica, all she really knows is that there's some sort of supernatural force in this distant dem democratic country, and that they have the ability to influence minds, which makes Azora extremely, extremely paranoid, because she is kind of mortified of that sort of thing to an extent. She doesn't like people messing around with minds. So... As she learns more about Monica, her rep opinion doesn't honestly improve very much because obviously they have opposing ideologies. And Azora's opinion of her is that she has effectively created a direct, a direct democracy in which she deceives people into believing they have a choice, but is using her mental influence to maintain absolute control in an unacceptable way. Azora likes order, but that sort of thing really unnerves her. And she considers it a threat to reality to have such capabilities. She also gets very annoyed with Monica because her initial request when she shows up with her invasion force is just that Monica and any other magic users of the country submit to examination to assess whether or not they are a threat to reality, which obviously is refused. And she gets basically increasingly frustrated with her enemy, especially when they end up fighting one another, which is a sort of cat and mouse type deal, I guess. So in the end, when we reach Shattered Illusion, which is the well, the torture part, basically, Alzora kind of loses it with Monica on several occasions. She's trying to get information out of her, but she kind of succumbs to that sadism of hers quite extensively for a while and does eventually end up breaking her. And she isn't quite happy about it, but she's not, like, utterly miserable about it either. Her emotions fluctuate a lot on the matter, and I suppose they reflect each other in a sense that both are opposing one another, both have sort of been shattered, as Sika said. Each of them has had very harrowing experiences that very much affect the way they operate, and they're, well, as I said, ideologically opposed to one another and can't really reconcile their beliefs with one another. Yes, and uh, to add on the that thing, where 
where during their fight with each other they keep they they communicate not not the way you would usually see in movies and things where they just shout at each other because that's actually kind of stupid um instead monica uses her tele, tele, telepathic abilities to to keep a conversation well not really a conversation but a connection to azora's mind throughout their brief but strange fight with each other in in an underground bunker essentially where they where azora continuously if i'm not remembering this wrong is trying to to convince monica to surrender until she eventually understands that she won't until she's beaten as he as Monica has already figured out, she is essentially already before, as far as Azora stepped in to Meriden, the city, which uh, the, this takes place in, um, Monica already knew she would be found, and she already knew she would lose. But as such, she would make Azora pay, uh, at least have to work for it. Which is something else Zora despises even more. Um, I, um, moving on, uh, would you say that this sort of dynamic between Monica and Azora reflects the uh, themes of the story? Uh, and if so, uh, what would you say the themes that you wanted to get across were? Well, it really depends on which chapter it is. Each chapter has its own theme, essentially. Well, Operation Sweeping Scythe, because uh, originally we had no real uh, name for it. Originally, yeah. we just called it we called it tourism, which is <laughs> just, just, yeah. it was just a joke on there that they that the Chidoka and um, the best. Uh, the the uh, to, the the um, top Chidokran tourist the tourist destination was Sartanania because there was four people who went there, uh, but yes, Yoki Chidoku was not known for its tourism industry. The po the point of sweeping scythe, uh, the scythe is what is an iconic weapon of Azora, and yeah, I have to ask Yoki, he came up with most of the. Uh, Sweeping Scythe was chosen for two main reasons. Firstly, because it sort of reflects the situation and that the Scythe is sweeping over Sartanania, examining it. And the other reason is that it has some nice alliteration. Indeed. Yes. And moving on from that, we come into Operation Mindbreaker, which was ominously a mistake to name it that way when we started writing Shattered Illusion. We yeah. should have a, 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 a name the opposite. Mindbreaker for that one, yes. But... Yes, as Shattered Illusion, basically they shattered the illusion of Monica. She has kept the illusion, kept herself hidden. And that would have been the better name for that. And Mindbreaker was... would have been the literal mind breaking. Mind breaking. <laughs> yes, the reason it was called Mindbreaker is because, well, they're going in, breaking into the country in order to attack an enemy whose most prominent characteristic militarily is mental capabilities. And the ability well, to manipulate emotions. And not stuff. really, but not the country, just mon. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. But that is their target. Um, so. Yes. And of course, if anyone else had the ability, which is actually one of the points of the torture, to discover if there is another, if there's a group of people, because until Azora meets Monica in person, she they have no knowledge of if there's more than one, if there's one person, if there's two people, if there's more people, while there in fact are, is just Monica. But they do not know this yet until, well, they find Monica, which leads to the to, to the situation of Shattered Delusion, where one of the main points of information that Azora tries to gather from Monica is 
is there anyone else? Which Monica, of course, denies because, well, obviously. But it's not quite true. It's the only instance of half-truth. Well, it's not, it's not even lying. It's actually just a half-truth. As Alzora qu uh, queries uh, Monica of whether there is anyone else like her in Sartanania, which there isn't. However, there is another person like her. The name of the character is Rose, and she's not involved in the story. And she left Sartanania before the ha it happened. Carrying on with the names, the Shattered Illusion. I can't quite remember why we named it Shattered Illusion, actually. Uh, do you, Kiyoki? Well, Shattered Illusion was named so because it involves a lot of shattering, both physically and mentally, due to the torture. And because there is a sort of sense of illusion in that, well, Monica makes use of illusions as one of her abilities, so it seemed fitting. Although it does have interesting connotations in that in the final set of posts of that particular chapter, Monica is so completely shattered that basically her entire existence is now an illusion. Indeed. It shatters, but at the same time creates a new illusion. An illusion that Azora at the same time regrets. Yes. She didn't As... quite intend for that to happen, but I think it's really like... done about it. Indeed. And enduring tyranny, while it may sound like it's a parody of Operation Enduring Freedom, it is actually not. I think it was uh, Pry, Pry who actually pointed this out in like the first post of uh, Operation Enduring Turing that, uh, that it sounded like it was just based on Operation Enduring Freedom, but not, nah, but tyranny. But that is actually just a coincidence. In fact, it has to do with how Enduring Tyranny is about the struggling between the Sartanians and the Chidokran in their attempts to coexist and the yes, troubles they that... have. The Sartananians are enduring tyranny for the first time. And at the same time, on how the Chidokrin are trying to have tyranny endure. Well, since most of the, since all the titles are essentially written from the Chidokrin perspective. So, uh, building off that, I was curious, uh, kind of going back a bit, but. Um, for Azora, what what is it about democracy that she finds so fundamentally flawed? Why does this uh, affect her so much? And on top of that, uh, how does that play into her self-styled uh, declaration of being the over lady of reality? Well. That's a bit of a complicated question, but the simple answer boils down to it was a very gradual development. Alzora has always effectively declared herself the supreme overlady of all reality ever since the she took over Kyoki Chidoku, but originally that was exactly what it sounds like. Egotism, because at the time she was even more crazy, and the whole tyranny thing was basically just an excuse to be able to torture as many people as possible. Over time, that belief in tyranny became a genuine conviction. The thing with Alzora is that she hates when she doesn't have control over things. She kind of has a pathological need to be in control of a situation because she gets extremely paranoid whenever there's too many unknown variables or things that go out of control. And for this reason, she dislikes chaos. And in her mind, democracy is a system that is effectively based entirely on internal division and using that internal division in order to effectively sustain the regime. She believes it's completely unsustainable and despises it and also despises the fact that a lot of people who do happen to believe in democracy are obviously opposed to her own ideology and her own regime. Interesting, interesting. So, I mean, obviously there are other characters in the RP. Uh, this is not necessarily a two-character piece. There are a lot of different ones, and some of them I quite enjoy. But um, bet 
between Azora and Monica, would you, what would you guys, who would you guys say is the protagonist? Who would you guys say is the antagonist? Uh, or, or do you guys even think those terms are applicable to this RPG? They really aren't applicable. They, since both of these two, these things, since the, it's, the story is written from up until the end of Shattered Illusion, which is uh, where the story between Azora and Monica ends in the part, in the in the entire in the entire RP, it ends with uh, after Shadow Illusion and with between them, um, both are the protagonist and the antagonist because they are each other's antagonists. Since it, it comes back, because I think I think we discussed a similar point where both of them essentially considers the other evil, in a way, and in the same way. They would both consider themselves the pro protagonist from their own points of view. So it really doesn't apply to the situation to call in protagonists and antagonists as they're both protagonists in the story. The other thing that's important is that if you're going to do the thing where you distinguish protagonists from heroes and such, and that the protagonist is the one who is making events happen and such. It's basically impossible to pin down a protagonist in an RP with multiple people in it, just because each post is going to effectively have its own separate protagonist, so both of them are going to be counted as protagonists, even though they antagonize each other. Though, if we're going to talk about morals, I would say Monica is probably the more moral of them, but even considering that, that doesn't necessarily make her any more or less a protagonist in this case. Personally, this is of course personal opinion, but because I would consider, even though I would personally be very paranoid over her mental manipulation ability, in reality she doesn't really use it very much on the people of her country, and she is not known for her ability to statistically torture and murder people. Well, she did murder people a few times. Yes. Um, but that is true. Then again, you can't exactly call it murder because it was actually a war. But at the end, there it's kind of murder. But it comes back to her character, and it's a scene that I could not write. Well, I wrote it, but I could not post it. Um, I let's let me just find which post it was before I say something wrong here. I asked. There were... It was a post I wrote. Uh, during a mental, basically a flashback scene, kind of that described the that is Monica's point of view on the final battle of the Sutternian Civil War during the torture. She's basically has passed out, and it's basically she's re-experiencing through memory the battle of the siege of Kaina, which is which is another city, and it. It got. It was basically. It ended with the capture of the city. However, the effectively every single person left left in the city was executed at the end of the fight. At the end of the battle, due to reasons that. I couldn't really describe it in this post because I don't know how NS or TNP rules really likes people writing about mercilessly executing unarmed uh, people. Like in that way, in the I way I wrote it, it was kind of it disturbed myself. So I, I had to rewrite it, but that that scene, which I cannot write, is has been plagued into Monica's mind. So, she li relives that moment. And it's one of the defining parts of her character as she steps out of, the of this building at the end of the post where... And they have effectively won. The, it's over. But 
the problem they face is at what cost. And this is what shapes both Sartanania and Monica as a character. So she sets about reforming Sartanania into what it is in the modern day. And she wants everyone to be important. Thus, she chooses the most logical and uh, basically equal society she can think of. A direct democracy where everyone has power. Which directly contradicts Alzora. Um, Fiji, Fiji uh, is disconnected. Uh, Fiji was asking uh, why you chose sort of a 1950s kind of aesthetic and setting for the RC. Well, it is because uh, of when the event, because of the Southern Indian Civil War, which occurred. Uh, which started on the on, in March 1950 and ended in 1953, which effectively destroyed the nation and such. Uh, effectively, it left the nation with a population of roughly 45,000 people, and as such, there is just not enough people, and. It, all advancements effectively halt because at this point you're trying to survive as a people and such the effectively their society and has basically become stagnant in complete isolation which is essentially why i picked 1950s because hmm, also because a specific 19, 19, uh, late 40s is technically uh, early 50s because it, it's, it looks uh, basically because I wanted it uh, basically half because I wanted a um, black and white ph photography and because um, I don't know I just did uh, both both, both actually, um, because I had like some original ideas for the character because I wanted the character be in a certain way. But at that point, when I created her, I didn't really know how to uh, put these ideas in. And eventually, about halfway into the into sweeping scythe, I decided upon the Sartanian Civil War. So, effectively, both uh, both ways, like both pre thought and both just placed in there. Azora and Monica comparison gets a bit difficult when you have to talk about specific moments because there's obviously a very major difference in the amount of time overall each character has. Azora's been around for like years at this point, and Monica was only introduced with this specific. RP. So to discuss every significant moment in our Zora's life would be a very long list. But she has had a lot of defining experiences, including a couple included within this RP. For example, when she does torture Monica at one point, she kind of loses it and that really terrifies her afterwards because she is completely adamant that she will not succumb to this sort of sadism, no matter what, and, well, that fails. So that is kind of a defining moment for her and that sort of thing. But talking about her life overall is probably going to take a very long time if I wanted to do that. But, yes, she does have a lot of defining moments, including some in this roleplay. And e even then, if you, if you think about the proposition in character, you have the difference Another different, la a very large difference between the character in their age. As I'm not sure exactly how old Alzora is. She's like 28 or something like that. Kyoki never tells us, but Monica is 90. Be very specific about age stuff, but go on. Monica is 90. And 
uh, such she has uh, such a such experienced uh, such a huge amount of things in her life which is really hard to portray as i have not i i'm not 90 years old i have not experienced these things <laughs> such but it's a very interesting thing to to write and it also creates a difference between these two characters as they 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 are so similar in so many ways but yet so different well going off of uh, azora and things that define her we've talked about it before we've hinted at it uh, a bit we uh kind of skirted around it but i think now is a good time to uh ask Kiyoki, go into detail what is the nightmare war you already kind of gave us a brief overview but i'm curious as to how it underscores the nation and your characters and how does it still affect the nation today because the nightmare war as i was reading this rp it was kind of ever present it even from the get-go even from the initial mission the team that uh infiltrates uh, Sartananya, uh they have to pull out because of war trauma so if you could uh, explain what exactly the nightmare war was and just how it affected uh shidoku that would be great the nightmare war is a very i say this a lot complicated affair but to summarize how it happened there was a series of incidents and such but effectively what happened was an alternate reality version of Kyoki Chudoku which had effectively achieved domination over an utterly apocalyptic world decided it was going to expand itself and live up to its legacy of conquering all reality this version of Kyoki Chudoku is called Tengoku and claims itself as the heaven of all worlds it's an extremely religious society with its version of Azora being worshipped as she beyond divinity and they have a couple of very psychologically debilitating habits they are very wasteful militarily when they invade but they have one of the common things that happened in the nightmare war was the use of child soldiers by Tengoku Rens and the thing with Tengoku Rens is that they are very much indoctrinated even to the extent of using arcane indoctrination to artificially induce obedience and happiness in their soldiers. So soldiers of the Nightmare War would often experience things such as being charged at by groups of singing children hiding behind walls constructed out of their own corpses and a lot of other graphic imagery such as that. I, When writing that particular war, there was obviously a lot of pushing the edge of acceptable boundaries and having to not go overboard with it but the war also ended up involving some other powers as a result of requesting allied help and various manipulations and by its conclusion i believe the total was 102 million chudokurens killed as a result of the war largely because of the absolute devastation that ensued from the conflict the fact that even nuclear weapons were used, biological weapons were prevalent, chemical weapons were very prevalent. A lot of cultural practices emerged from this, like shoe K marks, which are kind of hard to explain, but effectively a kill tally that you cut into yourself. That became a custom of Kyoku Chidoku because of that war. And it also led to extreme paranoia about any kind of supernatural threat. That kind of already existed, but after the nightmare, Kyoku Chidoku was absolutely adamant that they were never going to let this sort of thing happen to anyone in the world no matter what they thought they were not going to allow arcane threats to cause this amount of damage or almost destroy the entire country it was an absolutely brutal war that caused large amounts of psychological trauma and there was stuff like magical pain projectors which would fill you with agony and azora suffered a lot as well because she a lot of the people she had to fight in the war a couple of them were alternate versions of her own closest associates who tried to kill her and of course there was a confrontation between her and her other self that kind of leads to a lot of your psyche getting messed up having to go through all of that so to summarize it it was a very brutal conflict with 
that caused absolute devastation to the country, and the country is absolute still recovering from it, even in modern, like right now, RP. It is still recovering somewhat from this conflict, and its population is probably never going to recover from it because it's so utterly decimated. But yes, it had a very profound impact, and they are absolutely, completely influenced by those horrific events. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, one of the infiltrators mentioned how like the trees in Sarkinyanya, and I'm sorry, I can never say that the name of that country correctly. I, it, 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 it's a tongue twister for me, but uh, but I am strong. But uh, you mentioned how they were amazed by like the trees and the greenery because even you know after the war, so much of uh, Shadoku uh, has been reduced to ash, even the forest. So it's definitely something that kind of hangs over everyone. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting because uh, you get the sense, you get the sense that Shadoku's forces, Azora in particular, she's not there necessarily to land grab. Uh, it's not necessarily an expansion thing. There's very much a sense of uh, a mission. She's on a mission, and it it it, it 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 it's almost reluctant. Like they have to do this. Was was that the intent? Uh, yes, effectively. With regards to the expansion thing, of course, the <clears throat> excuse me, annexation and such. That was effectively a byproduct of having to deal with the main mission. It's just once they got Monica and such, they thought that the whole place was going to descend into chaos without their magical overlord present as they saw it. So they thought that the only way to preserve order in this area was to take control of it for themselves. But yes, that was effectively a somewhat reluctant choice to make. It wasn't why they went there in the first place, and they hadn't really intended to have to do that. Which, which really also plays into how, which it also re really sets the stage for entering tyranny, where it, it it's the situation of integrating, because the beginning of entering entering enduring tyranny is essentially politics, where they attempt to integrate the Sartanians into their society, and by using what is probably the best character well the best person i should say for the job a very considerate and slow working person that won't use force to do it unless absolutely necessary uh, i can't remember exactly his name the the overseer dude i forget his name a lot as well i think it was uh I remember the first name was Masazumi. I forget the second one. Uh, let me check that action. Yes, but yeah, he 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 even creates this uh, a he even takes on a Sartanian as an advisor, as someone who can give advice on how Sartanian opinion. And in fact, he is questioned by his, uh, by his, the military commander assigned to him on for the military detachment, who almost considered him to be, what's the right word for it, it's almost heretical in his uh, thoughts and about it, as it, it's not Chidoka, they, that, that's the thing, they, they force it. However... And it's a point of conflict between these two, Chidoka and As. They have different views on how to do it. And eventually, she, the, the commander obviously has to uh, follow the commands of the overseer. But she does so almost with reluctance. There is something of an irony to her accusations of the overseer's treachery, considering her own position is technically that if certain things about her were publicly known, she would have to be executed. Indeed. That's another dynamic of enduring tyranny that 
in my opinion, makes Enduring Tyranny one of the, uh, probably the best chapter we've written so far, actually. As it's essentially four stories at the same time. Where you have the story of the the Sartanian resistance movement, which is led by, what, what was her name? <laughs> A Sartanian, at least. And what effectively happens is at the same time you have the story of another uh, Sartanian, Magdalena, who becomes this advisor of the Chirokran overseer. And she and this Sartanian, because all Sartanians are not, they do not all, obviously, they're people. They do not hold the same political views, but of course, since it's direct democracy, enough people have to have the same view for it to make a difference. And she's in a very, very big minority who does not really think that the direct democracy is the way to go. Of course, tyranny is not exactly her idea of way to go, but she, th she has this idea that her new position could help her make this change and could help make her affect the decisions of the overseer to basically be more of the way she envisions Sartanaya could be. And at the same time, you have the overseer's point of view and the almost the conflict, but not really a conflict, but the conflict of, what's it called? Uh, uh, what's it called? A conflict of um, methods and ideals between Umeko, what's her face, uh, the commander of the, of the military detachment, and the overseer. And Umika's own story and her, I, if I haven't misunderstood it uh, completely, she's effectively a Tengokuren. Am I correct? She is what is called a Tengoku Tankyu. If I'm pronouncing that right, I don't know how to pronounce that word myself. But basically what that means is that in, after the aftermath of the Nightmare War, most of Kyoki Chidoku absolutely despises any concept of religion and such, considering they were fighting fanatics. And now Zora herself is very adamant on this as well, and she is especially adamant that nobody should have any kind of religion based around her, because that's what the Tengokurens had, and that kind of terrifies her. But Tengoku Tanku are people who effectively think that the idea of having the Supreme Overlady of All Reality revered as a divine figure is a good idea if it's the right Supreme Overlady of All Reality, their one. And so Umeko is one of those people who does effectively worship Alzora and her highest associates as somewhat divine entities, though she has to keep that classified and secret or else she's going to get executed for treason. Indeed. Which effectively makes Enduring Tyranny such an interesting thing to write, where so much is going on at the same time. Like, there were posts where we wrote from three or four different occurrences or like perspectives at the same time that occurred effectively simultaneously. And it's, very, it's a very interesting thing. And yeah, where the where we are at at, at the current state, the during the Sartanian uh, what's it called Sartanian resistance that when when the first actual fight between them because these people they are not soldiers they are not they 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 don't have any experience in fighting at all they they're civilians they're normal people mostly. Um, the leader, like the, the, the individual who had the idea of a armed resistance is a car mechanic. And that's like the, the idea that I have, like they're, they're people. They're, they're just your everyday, they could be you, effectively, if you, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. the, the, the resistance is very interesting because uh, the opening to the RP, uh, centered around the whole uh, tourism bit. 
you very much, uh, it's very much hammered home how different these societies, these societies are, not just in terms of tech level, uh, but uh, culture, uh, political outlook, uh, ethnicity, uh, language. Uh, there, there's a, a world of difference between them, and so I would, and so I, I, I'm curious. Uh, and I guess this is more for Pio Yolo. Sick of you, uh, so uh, if you felt so inclined, you can certainly answer answer it as well. How does uh, Chidoku, uh potentially even see integrating Spartan Anya, Spartan Anya into uh, its uh, domain? Because you know, just kind of coming from a perspective of, you know, kind of a, a geopolitical and cultural perspective, there seems to be so much of a difference that integrating it is going to pose a number of issues. Yes, well, obviously their initial annexation of the area was kind of unintentional. Mm -hmm. They weren't really planning on taking over the place initially, so when they did, for a while, they were kind of lost on how exactly to proceed with this. Now, with Satana District, as they called it, they had a couple of goals. They wanted to try to avoid going in the all-out genocidal route with this because they didn't want to cause any unnecessary suffering. They'd been through the Nightmare War already. They were kind of sick of dead people being everywhere. And, well... The area was kind of desolate, obviously, because it has such low population for all the stuff around. There's a lot of unused infrastructure and stuff in Sutton and District. But effectively, the idea of taking over Sutton and District was to integrate these people. As the overseer's philosophy indicates, the overseer, who was assigned to oversee the integration, believes that the Sutton-anians are a respectable and sophisticated people. They just are misguided and they need to be rehabilitated from their magic-induced direct democracy, as they joker and see it, in order to allow them to better appreciate tyranny and order, and that they would eventually come to understand the Chudokaran point of view and accept it. And the other goal that the Chudokarans had in Satna District was to uh, one day effectively allow all of those who had basically their homes and lives annihilated by the Nightman, who were still struggling to regain them, to allow them a sort of safe haven that wasn't going to, you know, activate traumatic stress as easily, that wasn't going to be surrounded by desolate wasteland and constant reminders of it. So the secondary goal, and really one that is also a very considerable goal, was to provide a nice sanctuary for those who suffered the most during that conflict and were still suffering to this day. The, basically, the reason that they wanted to integrate it rather than just, say, annihilate the whole place was because they didn't want to have to go with, through with genocide. They didn't want all those promises they'd made to be false. They wanted to prove that tyranny was superior, that it is the better option for these people, and that eventually they would come to understand that. So they wanted to use minimal force. Obviously, the Chudokarans were not entirely in agreement on this. The overseer was very gentle in his approach. And someone like Umeko, the commander, just wanted to get this over with and beat them to the ground so they would stop causing problems and just comply. So there were different perspectives on it, but that is effectively the reason why they thought they could pursue integration. Yes, and and like the uh, the Sartanians, like even though the Sartanian civil war was not very a pleasant conflict in and of itself, aside from the city of Prax, which was effectively leveled and the city of Kaina which was kind of heavily ruined uh, the 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 infrastructure the is still intact because the the point they put the original cause of the civil war was a desperation because of a lack because of a the threat of starvation due to a very bad situation which had been de developing over the past five years, leading up to the, its climax in 1950. Thus, the infrastructure was what's keeping people alive, and thus it was effectively a sacred thing you could not destroy. But in the end, 
everyone died. Thus, well, not everyone, but most people died. And thus, it leaves a very large, empty, almost desolate area that has this infrastructure. There's buildings, there is things there's, that nobody's used for the past 70, 60, 65, 70 years because there's nobody to use them. And effectively, it creates the situation where the Chidokern, when they actually learn about the... I think we had them learn about the Sarge 9 in Civil War. I, I think we had them learn about that. They... They have this... You have this degree of... Um, association where this nation has also been completely devastating by an internal war. Although in a very different way. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. I noticed those parallels, how both of these uh, societies, uh, both sides to this, are sort of, I don't want to say traumatized, although that's almost fitting. They're sort of traumatized by past events. Uh, each nation is sort of moving on in its own way. Shidoku's obviously got a more um, aggressive way of dealing with uh, a lot of stuff they dealt with, trying to ensure that it doesn't happen again, whereas uh, Spartanania is, is, is kind of more insular. Um, was this intentional, or was it kind of just a happy coincidence that this sort of parallel popped up? Um, both. I think, uh, like, uh, the, um, it wasn't exactly intentional for it to be such a parallel in the same way. Uh, since originally the Sartanian civil war was effectively just a way to reduce Sartanian's population to such a low degree that it could have the population I wanted it to have without being completely unrealistic, because that would never happen. So, in fact, I had to have something that devastated the nation to such a degree. In fact, when I first created the Sartanian Civil War, I didn't even know about the, the Nightmare War. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Yes, um, let's, let's begin with the first real fight scene of uh, the story, which is halfway through Operation Mindbreaker, when Azora and Monica encounters each other. The way we effectively handled it was that we agreed on this is what they will they can do. It, we agreed on the... We, basically, I explained the area she was in. It is a underground... Uh, basically, it is a bomb... It's basically an underground bomb shelter bunker to protect from basically aerial attacks the citizens of the city basically built before the civil war but it's basically nobody even know uh, half of and everyone doesn't even know they exist anymore because they've never been used effectively so monica is there because she hides her existence because she does not she thinks she sees her duty to the nation to be complete. She she sees herself as an outcast of the nation, and she she should be dead. Effectively, uh, she, she should not be able to be this old. It's because of her rather unnatural existence that she is this old. So she faked her own death in the seventies, but. When the Chidokran, so basically what we did was, she's in this bunker. It's a very large complex. So what we did was, we agreed on that. We agreed on what they are, what they, who they, what they can do, what they are equipped with. In Monica's case, uh, she's equipped with a handgun, uh, to an example. And effectively, we decide what we want to do, how we want to proceed with each post, but and then effectively discuss some of these more intricate parts, such as when, when, 
what's her face, what's her face, uh, Monica first wounds Alzora. We discussed that, like, I want to basically make it more exciting by actually doing anything because Alzora is keeping up this shield in front of her to protect herself from gunfire, obviously, because plot armor is boring mm -hmm. and Monica is not that bad of a shot, so she's going to hit. But if Alzora, since Alzora is capable of projecting a protection in front of her, the ammunition will be ineffective. So what we did was, we discussed it, and we said, yeah, she can wound her. So we had her walk past, because Monica is invisible. Well, she, she's not technically invisible, that's, that's more complicated than that. And she holds a fire until Monica, until Azores passed, because Monica has realized that she's keeping a shield in front of her. And she shoots her from behind. And it works. We had to agree on that. And basically, it's a very, in, it's very intricate. That, that specific fight was very complicated. Uh, if Kyuk can chime in here. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what I can add to that. It's a fairly detailed analysis of how it was done. It was quite an intricate experience. There were, of course, some more improvised elements of it, and obviously we were basically planning the specifics of this as it was being written and such. And yes, basically, this sort of duel and stuff, I personally do have a fair bit of experience writing this sort of thing. I've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one fight so this is a very interesting example because it's not so much a direct duel as it is a sort of hide and seek where if Azora does finally get to her target she's going to decimate her pretty quickly but Monica is very difficult to actually catch so it had a very different dynamic to what I'm personally used to which made it quite interesting and obviously we did agree on the outcome before we began the confrontation and such because in this case if you're going to do that sort of thing with a situation like this it's generally best to do that unless you're willing to have particular characters die so we agreed that monica was going to lose but it was going to be a rather protracted battle and such yes as in fact monica could have won but not with what she had available to herself had she had more ammunition, she could have won. There's so many like intricate things that if you not don't know the outcome, because we didn't tell anyone the outcome. Obviously, people know it's Azora. Azora's going to win, but because there's no way Kyoko is going to kill off Azora, but it might have been a draw. Like Monica might have escaped. That might might have also been a possible outcome of the uh, of the con confrontation, but. She didn't. In the end, Azora catches her and makes the fatal decision to capture her instead of kill her on the fly, really. Although that was kind of planned because we wanted Shattered Illusion yeah. to happen. Azora was trying to capture her basically for the arcane assessment and interrogation since she only had one supernatural target. The reason for the capture was effectively okay, I have one of you, but if there's more of you, I want to know about that, so I'll interrogate the one that I do have, and also if I can assess what capabilities this one has, which I kind of have by fighting them, we'll be able to figure out what other possible threats we're dealing with here. So we'll take this one captive back to Kyoki Chidoku to undergo some examination, and I'll see if I can get the information out of her on the way. And there is like, so, there's so much more to talk about. I mean, uh, I mean, no, uh, like, like I said, we've kind of uh, gone through audience questions, we've kind of gone through questions on our part. However, uh, if there's anything else you guys would like to add, um, we're kind of getting to the point where we should consider probably winding it down. But if there's anything else that we uh, didn't touch on that you guys really want to go into, uh, you guys can uh, do that now. Yes, in fact, uh, there is a couple of th interesting things we can talk about here. That the um, I was thinking of something. Let's see. 
the uh, the entire like purpose of RP, and not really RP here itself now, but really the purpose, a thing about the, the RP has become, and its point in like in relevance to the rest of the RMB RP, which like it feels kind of weird to say that, but it's 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 an RP that I like. I I really like to like give people when they. As soon as someone talks about like RP and things like it's it's a very good example of how RP can be written and collaboration and cooperation, which is of as we have said in previous broadcasts, like something we want to promote. And this is one of those RPs that, at least in my experience, is ex so extremely like cooperatively written that I don't think you can write this kind of story without cooperating to this insane degree. Indeed, it kind of touches on some of the things that we've been um, discussing over the course of all of the uh, NDS RP shows, uh, both Eric and Strandrill, which is uh, stressing kind of the upside to RP collaboration rather than um, competition. And in this uh, case, I think you really see kind of the fruits of that labor where, uh, as Tika, you mentioned that you move to hand Kaoki quite a bit, but it, I mean, it works out in the end, right? Because you're, uh, I mean, the proof's on the page. The RP is very interesting. It's got a lot of different characters, it's got a lot of different plots kind of interwoven throughout. And uh, it really shines as a great example of what I believe collaborative uh, RP can accomplish. Uh, you know, instead of this very easily could have been uh, Kaoki uh, just kind of going, it's like, we're going to invade Spartanania now. And, but no, it, it much more there's a lot of really good character work so uh yeah that's definitely on display yeah and it has also become a little bit of like a poster child almost of like what people what what we can what we are in brp really can achieve if we if we actually try to work together and and really try to produce something great because I know I know I've talked to you before about this probably like I've gotten at least three people to get more interested in actually reading RPs that maybe are not involved in SR beforehand because it just shows that we are capable of it when we really come together. And I think that most people are really capable of it. And are just and are limited by a mindset of something, which can always be changed. Communication is key. Like proper communications, uh, understanding of the other person, uh, really coming to terms with the person, like really forget, like throw away the ideals of basically being better. You you are two equals. You have to be coming to a mindset that you're writing a story and that it's it's the two of yous or the three of yous or the number of people you are story you're writing portraying through characters you have because you're now a team of writers writing a story. And it's so very important because it's built on a system, on a on communicative cooperation. And it is of such vital importance. <coughs> Sorry. Well, I think that's kind of why um, the the, the dis why Discord has been such a boon for uh, RP in general. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty old, 
uh, I, 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 I mean, I'm pretty old as far as the NS player base goes. I've been playing this game since uh, 2006. And uh, I remember when RPs were collaborated on, you know, if we even collaborated with each other, we did it through AOL Instant Message, just to give you an idea of how uh, ancient I'm talking. And then as time went on, we kind of moved to IRC, but even that had its problems. But Discord, uh, I think, has really made it easy for our community to uh, not only connect, but stay connected. And as a result of that, uh, collaboration is now easier than it uh, has been. And uh, granted, I'm not in Strange Real, but I think this is kind of a universal thing, you know, Eric, Strange Real, or any other RP community, that uh, when you're on Discord, and the chances are you're going to be talking about your nation, you're going to be talking about ideas you have, you know, in in the lounge, in world building channels, you're going to be talking. And other people are going to be talking. And when you see someone who has an idea that connects with what you want to do, it's very easy to just send them a DM, say, hey, I kind of like what you were talking about. Is there a chance you could do something? And that's how collaboration starts. And it seems like that's exactly what you guys did. And it's really uh, fascinating to see the results because it's quite good. And it's really an example, I think, that not just, uh, not just Strange Real, uh, but the TNP RP community as a whole can really hold up and say, this is the sort of thing we want to promote. So uh, I know that, you know, we could probably talk about the story for another couple of hours, but we are <laughs> kind of over and we're, we're, we're well over an hour already. And I, think it's, I think it's probably best for the uh, sanity of uh, not just our audience members here, but uh, our listeners in the future to, to sort of uh, bring it in now. So yeah. with that being said, uh, Kiyoki, uh, Sika, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, BG, uh, thanks for, again, doing the legwork to make this happen. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank Take you. For, thank you for having us here and uh, doing this with us because it's been, it's, been, it's, been it's been really fun. It's been fun, interesting, and yes, thank you for having me. Have a free cookie. I will put the cookie in the trash can, but that is not a reflection on you, I'm just being. <laughs> I mean, it did have cyanide in it, so. <laughs> hey, 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 KCC cookies are great, but we should really wrap this up now.